Welcome to your Anatomy and Physiology Unit 2 exam review. And like always, your review information can be found in the tape section. So this time I'm broadcasting my screen to kind of walk you through like usual. Again, I've written a PDF review. When you go to the Dr. Higgs tip section and you click on the unit to review, it brings up this little PDF here. And I created this the same way I created the unit one review. I go chapter by chapter, bullet point by bullet point for that chapter. Remember, this is just a rewording of the objectives on Blackboard. It's just reworded, hopefully, to make it more direct and straightforward. And before we even get into this review, you actually know a lot about it already. Yes, obviously from studying, but you know a lot from lab. Remember from our first review, I mentioned lecture and lab repeat themselves over and over again. So you hear something in lecture and then you hear it again in lab, or sometimes you might hear it first in lab, and then you'll hear it again in lecture. Major difference is you get a little bit more detail in lecture than you do lab. But for this material, a lot of it you already know, and you've already taken your first lab exam, so you see that you can handle the material. And so what is repeated? Well, for one, it's tissues. Remember, chapter four for lecture is tissues. So a lot of this you already know. And you're going to have to kind of read, know it again if you've forgotten it. Like the definition of a tissue. We actually know that way back from chapter one. Remember, a tissue is just a bunch of cells that look similar to each other working together for a common goal. This is just your lecture PowerPoint slides. I didn't make my own slides again this time because I feel now the uh, department slides are really good. So again, got to know that definition of a tissue. Remember, it's just cells that look similar to each other, so they have similar function, or similar structure, sorry, and they're working together for a common goal. That's a similar function. That's what it means to be a tissue. And then you're going to have to remember that structural hierarchy of the human body. Oh, you remember at your simplest level, your chemical level, you're nothing more than atoms and elements. And then you work your way up to a cell, then a tissue, then things like an organ. Remember, to be an organ means you need to be made up of at least two different tissues. You got to know this structural hierarchy. Okay. And then before we get into tissues, remember, you're at one level, you're just cells. And we know tissues are just cells. And you got to know how you holding the cells together in the tissue. You got to know your cellular junctions. You got to know your cellular junctions and their major uh, characteristics, so to speak. <clears throat> so again, I'm just returning to your lecture PowerPoint, going to the section for junctions. You got to know these three cellular junctions. There's tight junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions. They kind of give you a hint in the name, like the first one. Tight junctions create a tight seal so that there's no leaks. Keyword here is no leaks. For some tissues, yes, there is a possibility of leakage, but we're going to keep it simple on our exams. Tight junctions create a tight seal so that there's no leaks. And you have some, for example, in your Sweating is not leaking, that's secretion. You're pumping out the sweat. But without sweating, your skin is dry because there's no leaks. Then again, keep going, got other uh, cell junctions. There's a desmosome. Desmosomes create, <clears throat> excuse me, a strong seal so that they could withstand mechanical stress. Whenever you hear the word mechanical, think physical. So I'm kind of pulling, pushing, stretching. Your tissues can withstand these mechanical, these physical stresses because they're held together by a very strong seal. It has increased strength. It's a strong seal. And you can see why. Over here, you see a picture of a desmosome compared to other junctions like tight junctions. This one has a lot more proteins holding the cells together. So it's a stronger seal because you have more reinforcement. And then there's one more type of cell junction. It's a gap junction. Again it, again, it tells you in the name. A gap junction, when you look at it, has gaps, has little holes in it. Well, these holes, these gaps, allow the cells to communicate with each other. 
either with electrical signals or chemical signals. It's allowing information, nutrients, electricity to pass from one cell to another. And one place you have it is in cardiac muscle tissue. That's the heart. Turns out you know, your heart beats as one. Even though your heart's made up of many cells, all those cells contract. They beat at the same time. Why? It's because they all practically instantaneously get the same signal at the same time via these gap junctions. So yeah, they allow cells to communicate, share information in the form of electrical signals so that you could do things like have all the cells contract and beat as one in the heart. So make sure you know those gap junctions. Keep it as simple as I mentioned it. And then for the rest of the chapter, yes, we're going to focus heavily on the tissues. You know from your first lab exam that you have four major tissues. You got to know them again. Epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous tissue. And then I know it's a lot of tissues. We got into some of it in lab. But you got to know all the ones we mentioned for lecture. But like usual, it helps if you focus your mind. For every single tissue that we go over in lecture, you have to know their location. Where do you find them? Their function, what does that tissue do or what is it good at? And then what are some special structures or cells in the tissue? That's all, all these other bullet points are practically just rewording this one bullet point over and over again. <clears throat> and we did a lot of this for some tissues when we were doing lab. You're just doing that for every tissue. Okay. So for example, when we look at epithelial tissues, well, for you to know them, of course, you're going to have to name them. Remember, it's pretty straightforward to name an epithelial tissue. Remember the first part of the name? Remember if you're simple, it means you have one layer. Stratified means more than one. And pseudostratified means you're falsely looking like more than one. Then the second part of the name had to deal with the shape of the cells. Remember, if you're a flat or squished looking cell, you're squamous. If you're plump and boxy like a cube, you're cuboidal. And if you're tall and cylindrical or tall and rectangular, we call you columnar. And then you end with the word epithelium for epithelial tissues. We knew that. <clears throat> Keep going. So you can see these are just us rewording this one bullet point over and over again. Where do you find these tissues? What do these tissues do? What's special about them? Well, for epithelial tissues, one special thing is they're avascular. There's no blood vessel. And their cell is the epithelial cell. It um, doesn't matter what shape that cell is, uh, squamous, cuboidal, or columnar. They are all epithelial cells. All right. But then there's some things that don't fall into that one little bullet point of uh, what is it, where do you find it, what is it good at in structures. Well, there's some extra things we got to know, like this bullet point here. Well, if you go back and you listen to your chapter of your PowerPoints, you'll see that a lot of your epithelial tissues form glands, especially those cuboidal tissues, those cuboidal cells. Turns out those cuboidal epithelial cells are really good at secretion, pumping things out. So we tend to find them in structures that pump things out, which are glands. So we spend time talking about glands. Why? Because you got a lot of them. Just think back to chapter one. Think back to when we did organ systems. Think back to when we did things like the endocrine system. Remember, the endocrine system is made up of a whole bunch of glands that make hormones. And they're not the only glands in your body. So when we look at all the glands in your body, they fall into one or two categories. They're either an endocrine gland or an exocrine gland. And you got to know the difference. Major difference has to deal with really how are they releasing their products. Because they're both glands, so they're both going to release a product. It's a matter of how. It's a matter of whether or not you need a duct. If you need a duct to release your product, you're an exocrine gland. If you do not need your uh, duct uh, to release your product, you're an endocrine gland. That's the major difference. Exocrine glands need a duct, a tiny tube to release their products. Endocrine glands do not. They directly drop their products into the bloodstream without a tube, without a duct. 
That's what you need to know. That's the major difference between endocrine and exocrine glands. Endocrine glands make hormones that they dump directly into the bloodstream, while exocrine glands make products that they're going to have to release via dump. And then to kind of finish off these glands, we even talk about how they release their products. Remember, I keep mentioning, even though talking about uh, tissues and glands, really, you got to remember, you have a cellular level. So when we talk about glands releasing their product, we're really talking about how the cells release their product. Okay. What you got to know are the three types of secretion. There's merocrine secretion, holocrine secretion, and apocrine secretion. You got to know those three. Just going over it real quickly. Remember, they're all secretion, so they're all how your cells going to release their product. So how does the cell release its product in merocrine secretion? Well, in merocrine secretion, it's super simple. The cell packages its product into a vesicle and spits it out. Oh, that sounds a lot like exocytosis. Remember, you package something in a vesicle and kick it out. Oh, that's exocytosis. That's basically what you're doing in merocrine secretion. You're packaging your product into a vesicle and then exporting it out of the cell, kicking it out of the cell. This is what you do with your saliva. Your saliva gets kicked out in little vesicles by your cells. Yeah. Keep going. And there's holocrine secretion. If you're a cell doing secretion and you had to pick, odds are you don't want to pick holocrine secretion. Oh boy. Why? Well, it turns out for a cell to release its product via holocrine secretion, the cell has to burst and die. Oh, yeah, the cell has to explode. It has to pop to release its product. Turns out that's how your sebaceous gland cells release their oil called sebum. The cells literally explode, and that explosion releases the product. That's holocrine secretion. And then the last type of secretion is called apocrine secretion. This is a, almost like a milder form of holocrine. How? For the cell to release its product via apocrine secretion, it needs to pinch a part of itself off. It needs to break off a piece. And that piece it breaks off contains the released product. So instead of the entire cell popping, you just break off a piece. And that piece contains the product. So those are your three types of secretion. Did you package it into a vesicle before you kicked it out? Merocrine. Did you burst to kick it out? Holocrine, or did you just pinch off a piece to kick it out? Apocrine secretion. You all right? Keep going. Keep these things as straightforward as, as how I'm keeping it. Again, a lot of this we already did when we did our, un, our lab one review, like this one here. Remember, we looked at things like connective tissues, and we saw around the, the tissues around the cells. Remember, the environment around the cells is called the extracellular matrix. You got to know what it makes it up. It's two things. It's liquid and it's proteins. Remember, the gel-like liquid is called ground substance. Things dissolved in it, like carbohydrates. And then there's protein fibers, three protein fibers to be specific. And you got to know their function. It's collagen, elastic, and reticular fibers. Think back to lab. Remember, collagen fibers were the pink fluffy ribbons we saw under the microscope. Remember, collagen helps to prevent excess stretching while also providing some flexibility. Remember, your elastic fibers give you elasticity, kind of like a rubber band. Remember, that's your ability to snap back, to recoil to your normal size after you've been bent or stretched. And then reticular fibers form a mesh or a network to either trap things or support things. Well, you knew that from lab. All right, so you knew these whole sections here. And then again, just repeating that bullet point from uh, earlier, you got to know your tissues, even for connective tissues, you got to know them, got to locate them, you got to tell me what they do and if they have any special structures. Okay. <clears throat> and then there's something special about some connective tissues, like cartilage. Cartilage is special, just like epithelial tissue. Why? It's also avascular. To be avascular means you have no blood vessels. So just like epithelial tissue, cartilage has no blood vessels. Okay. 
Remember, we've gone through an osteon before with its central canal in the middle, its lamellae wrapping around with the osteocytes in their lacuna communicating via little channels called canal liculi. We've done that already. Just review. And then there's blood. Remember when we looked at blood, we saw the three cells of blood. Remember the pink discs or the red blood, let's call them erythrocytes. Remember they carry oxygen. Remember there's the white blood cells, the leukocytes. Remember they fight infections. And then there's platelets, sometimes called thrombocytes, that help you to stop bleeding by clotting the blood. And you even saw the two cells of nervous tissue. Remember, it's the neuron and the neuroglial cell. Remember, the neuron is doing the work of the nervous system by sending and receiving electrical signals. And you remember, the neuroglial cell is just taking care of the neuron. <clears throat> Again, just rewording that first bullet point for all your tissues. Make sure you could locate them. Tell me their function, what's special about them. All right. And then to finish off this chapter, here's some more things. And we talk about membranes, and then we talk about how do you fix a damaged tissue. Okay. First up, your membranes. You got to know your four membranes. <clears throat> and like usual, we've talked about some of this already. All right, let's go. Sorry, let's go to this section in chapter four that talks about your membranes. There we go. So you have four major membranes. One, you already, chapter one, it's your serous membrane. It's still the same serous membrane from chapter one. Nothing's new about it. You already know where it is. It lines your internal body cavities. You already know we can name the serous membrane after whatever cavity it's in. Remember, when your serous membrane lines the cavity holding the lung specifically, we call it the pleura. It still has its two layers. There's an outer parietal layer touching the walls to the cavity and an inner visceral layer touching the organ. So the layer touching the lungs will be the visceral pleura. I could ask those same questions again. And you know the serous membrane makes the serous fluid to separate those two layers to reduce friction. None of this is new. You know all about the serous membrane already. So let's try another one. Another membrane is called a synovial membrane. Don't be intimidated. Its name actually gives you a hint. It's called synovio for synovium, which means joints. So it tells you in the name where you find it. This is a membrane, synovial membrane, that lines your joints. It's very similar to the serous membrane. How? It also makes a fluid. Your synovial membrane makes synovial fluid, again, to reduce friction. Keep going. Got two more membranes. You still know some of these. Okay. Here's another one. It's the mucous membrane. Your mucous membrane lines cavities that are open to the external environment. All right. So what's a cavity that's open to the external environment? It's your mouth. The inside of your mouth, that lining, that moist lining you feel inside your mouth, that's just your mucous membrane. And then the last membrane, you know for sure. You know it from chapter one also. It's your cutaneous membrane, also called the skin. How oh, you knew about skin? Turns out your skin, which is on the surface of your body, is a membrane. So that's your four membranes. You got to know your four membranes and where do you find them. That's it. Okay. So one more time, serous membrane lines your internal body cavities. And we can name it after the cavity, so I'm going to ask those naming questions. Then there's your mucous membrane, lines cavities that are uh, exposed to the external environment. And your synovial membrane lines your joints and produ produces a synovial fluid to reduce friction. And your skin, aka your cutaneous membrane, lines the surface of your body and it provides protection. And then to finish off, we talk about how do you fix a damaged tissue? Well, when you damage a tissue, there's two types of, or two options your body has. Like usual in this class, your body has options. And when it comes to fix, fix, when it comes to fixing the tissue, you could either do regeneration or you could do fibrosis. 
So you got to know the difference. What's the difference between regeneration and what's the difference between uh, fibrosis? Well, they're both re or they're both tissue repair. So they're both going to be how you fix the damaged tissue. And when we talk about a damaged tissue, you're really looking at dead and damaged cells. Remember, tissues are just a bunch of cells. And when you fix it, you're replacing those dead and damaged cells with something else. So the real question is, is, is what do you replace dead and damaged cells with in regeneration and fibrosis? So let's do regeneration first. That's what you see in this picture. In regeneration, you replace dead and damaged cells with the original cells that are supposed to be in that tissue. Okay, you replace it with the same grouping of cells. That's regeneration. You replace dead and damaged cells with the same type of cells, the original cells that's supposed to make up that tissue. So for example, if I were to cut through my skin, which has that stratified squamous epithelium, I should replace it with more squamous epithelial cells in a stratified arrangement because that's the same grouping of cells. And it turns out when you replace dead and damaged cells with the same cells, your eyes can't tell the difference. Okay. For example, if I damaged my skin and replaced it with skin cells, my eyes can't tell where the original cells ended and the new ones begin. So we say when you regenerate, there is no scar. Your eyes cannot tell a difference. Okay. This is what happens in things like a paper cut. When you get a paper cut that does not bleed, it will eventually heal and not leave a scar. That's you seeing your body do regeneration. <clears throat> but on the other hand, you got one more option. It's called a fibrosis. Now, in fibrosis, what do you replace dead and damaged cells with? Well, in fibrosis, you don't replace the dead and damaged cells with the same cells. You actually don't replace it with cells at all. You replace the dead and damaged cells with collagen. So when you look at it, your eyeballs are going to be able to tell the difference. They're going to be able to tell the difference between the cells normally in the area and the collagen that's been inserted. So we say when you do fibrosis, you replace dead and damaged cells with collagen and you will leave a scar. That's the difference. Okay. <clears throat> And then lastly, you got to know which tissues will regenerate and which tissues will fibrose. We're sticking to the four tissue categories. Epithelial tissues will regenerate. Ah, nervous tissue does not regenerate. Nervous tissue fibrosis. It makes sense when you think about it. Think about a spinal cord injury. No one from a spinal cord injury. Your paralysis is permanent because you do fibrosis in, in nervous tissue. If you learn to do regeneration in nervous tissue, you will win a Nobel Prize. Okay. Then there's connective tissue. Turns out not all connective tissues all this are the same. Most of your connective tissues will regenerate except for cartilage. Cartilage does not regenerate. Cartilage fibrosis because of the lack of blood vessels. You got to think, if I need to regenerate, I need a way to send my ingredients to the area and to help repair it. Well, there's no blood vessels. It's almost like there's no roads for you to get your ingredients there. So cartilage will not regenerate. Cartilage will fibrose. But all your other your connective tissues will regenerate. And then there's the same problem with muscle tissues. Not all muscle tissues are the same. Turns out smooth muscle tissue can regenerate, but skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue will fibrose. This is why if you ever cut your muscle, get an injury or wound that cuts your muscle, your muscle will actually have a scar. If you were to cut off a piece and put it under a microscope, you will see a scar. You will see collagen. Same thing for a heart. That's why a heart, or a heart attack is so bad. Because during a heart attack, you damage and you kill heart cells. And they're going to fibrose. So you hear someone say they had a heart attack. Now they say they feel weak or their doctor tells them not to do too much strenuous work because their heart is weak. It's actually true because now they're missing some heart tissue. Because that dead and damaged heart tissue has been replaced with collagen. And collagen can't move. It's not muscle. But again, keep it simple. Know what can regenerate and what can't. 
epithelial tissue, all your connective tissues except for cartilage and smooth muscle tissue can regenerate. While cartilage, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and nervous tissue will fibrose. That's chapter four. And then, starting off in chapter five, we begin hopping from organ system to organ system. So in chapter five, we do integumentary system, and in chapter six, we do skeletal system. <clears throat> and again, you know some of this, because we did lab, and we did do skin and bones and lab. So a lot of this, again, is a repeat with a little extra detail. First up is skin. For skin, you got to know its parts. Turns out your skin has two layers to it. There's the superficial epidermis and the deep epidermis. And you just spend this chapter really into those two chapters, then talking about some additional structures, mainly hair, nails, and glands. Okay. So first, let's look at the epidermis. For the epidermis, even though it's the top thinner, broken down into sublayers. You got to know your five layers of the epidermis in order from the deep layer to superficial layer. And you got to know what's unique about each of those layers. Okay. So I'm going to help show you. Just go on to a picture of the epidermis and we'll look at those five layers and talk about them real quickly. <clears throat> and your textbook even gives you a little mnemonic to help you remember the layers in order from bottom to top. Uh, it's up to you. I use a different one, actually, when I was a student. But here it is. Here's their mnemonic. Brilliant studying gives loads of confidence. Oh, you could tell a teacher made that. When I was a student, we used big, strong guys love candy. Like most mnemonics, just take the first letter in every word. gives you the first letter in the word you need to know. Uh, for example, or let's go in order. From bottom to top. The bottom layer is called the stratum basal. That's why it's B. Then above it is the stratum spinosum. Then the darker layer is the stratum granulosum. Then the stratum sidum. And the top layer is the stratum corneum. So what's unique? Let's go layer by layer, starting off with the bottom layer, the stratum basal. In this layer, your cells are mitotically active, meaning that they could undergo mitosis and cytokinesis. This is the layer that's going to help to make all the other layers. Your skin grows from the bottom layer of the epidermis on up. All those keratinocytes making up the epidermis, they start off as baby cells practically in the stratum basal, and they mature as they reach the surface. And by the time they're in the stratum corneum, they're dead and they'll slough off. They'll flake away. So your skin grows from the bottom up. Keep going. Then there's the stratum spinosum. Your stratum spinosum layer is called spinosum because some cells look like they have spines or spikes coming off of them. Those spines and spikes allow cells to hold on to each other. So this stratum spinosum layer is really good at resisting mechanical stresses. Yeah, because cells are holding on to each other here. Keep going. Go to the stratum granulosum layer. Remember this layer. It's called stratum granulosum because when you look at the cells, they look like they have little specks inside. Those are the granules. Remember, those granules contain fluid that will help the cells, the keratinoids, to make keratin. So we say keratinization occurs in the stratum granulosum. And you remember, keratin is a waxy protein, meaning, meaning it's a protein that acts like wax. And one thing wax could do is create a barrier for moisture. So we say the stratum granulosum layer, because it's where you have lots of keratin, is a waterproof layer. And remember, this layer also pre prevents diffusion. So any layers above it will have dead cells. That's the two last layers. The stratum lucidum and the stratum corneum both contain dead cells because they've been cut off from diffusion by all the keratin in the stratum granulosum layer. But what else is unique to them? Remember, the stratum lucidum is not found in all your skin. Oh, we got to remember, we have different types of skin. You got to know the difference between thick and thin skin. Remember, one difference is how many layers. Remember, thick skin has all five layers, while thin skin has four because it's missing stratum lucidum. Remember, your thin skin has hair, while your thick skin does not. 
Remember, your thick skin is on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, or your thin skin is everywhere else. So those are differences. And one is that the stratum is found in thick skin, not thin. And then there's the stratum corneum the top layer of your skin. Remember, all the cells are dead here, and this is the layer that tends to flake off. To slough off means to flake off or exfoliate. Okay. So that's your five layers of the epidermis. And I mentioned a lot of your epidermis is made up of keratinocytes, but they're not the only cell there. There are other cells in your epidermis, so we got to know them. You got to know your cells in the epidermis and what do those cells do? There's, you already know one. It's called the keratinocyte. Turns out keratinocytes tell you in the name. They make keratin. But there are other cells. You got to know these other cells. For example, there's something called a dendritic cell or a Langerhorn cell. And these are basically white blood cells. And you know what white blood cells do. They fight infection. Remember, to fight infection is an immune function. So your dendritic cells provide immunity. They fight infection. Keep going. Think about what your skin could do. You could feel things on your skin. You could feel because you have sensory receptors. They're cells. We call them Merkel cells, sometimes called tactile cells, just in case you use a different textbook. These Merkel cells are just sensory receptors helping you to feel light touch. And then you got one more cell in your epidermis. It's called the melanocyte. Your melanocyte makes a pigment called melanin. That's why it's called a melanocyte. Melanocytes make melanin. And when people think about melanin, it is a pigment that gives your skin its color. But when they think about melanin, they usually think color brown black. Well, melanin actually has a broader range than that. It ranges anywhere from orangey red all the way to brown black. The more of it you have, the darker brownish to black that you are. All right. But it does ex exist in this broader range. So everybody, as long as you're not an albino, has melanin to a certain extent. And we'll talk about what of the exam review. <clears throat> but those are your cells in the epidermis. Keratinocytes make keratin, melanocytes make melanin, dendritic cells fight infections, and Merkel or tactile cells help you feel light touch. Keep going. Then we could look at the dermis. Well, we got to see the layers of the dermis and what's in the dermis as well. Now let's go down to dermis now. In the dermis, you can always tell you're in the dermis based off the tissue. We saw the epidermis had that non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Remember, your dermis has dense irregular connective tissue. So you're going to see pink fluffy ribbons, aka collagen, going wherever they want. And you're going to see the fibroblasts making them. All right, so we know at least the fibroblast is a cell in the dermis because it's the cell making all the collagen fibers. And just like the epidermis, we break up the dermis into multiple layers. Luckily, it only gets broken up into two. Remember, there's the superficial papillary layer. And you can always tell this layer because it has dermal papilla. Remember, papilla in anatomy is a finger-like projection. So sometimes the dermis looks like it sends finger-like projections into the epidermis. We call those dermal papilla. Wherever you see dermal papilla, you are in the papillary layer. Let's go to a picture. And you can see that. You can see these little finger-like projections of the dermis pushing up into the epidermis. Those are derma papilla. Okay, so this is the papillary layer. The rest of the dermis, most of the dermis, deeper is the reticular layer. And it's in the reticular layer where you're going to begin to find your accessory structures. Hair begins there and your glands begin in the reticular layer of the dermis as well as other things. Your reticular layer also has receptors. We call them piscinian or lamellated corpuscles. They help you to feel pressure and vibration. So when your phone vibrates in your pocket, you're possibly able to feel it thanks to lamellated corpuscles. And that reticular layer, yes, it does. Or, sorry, papillary layer. 
Yes, it does have dermapapilla, but why? Why does the dermis push up into the epidermis? Well, turns out dermapapilla have blood vessels in it because remember, dermapapilla is dermis. So it has the dense irregular connective tissue. And that's not cartilage. So it has blood vessels. Turns out all those blood vessels in the dermapapilla are helping to provide oxygen and nutrients to all the cells in the epidermis. Why? Because your epidermis is avascular. But this, we saw there are living cells in the epidermis. So for them to get their oxygen and nutrients, they're relying on diffusion thanks to all those tiny blood vessels in the dermal papilla of the papillary layer of the dermis. Yeah. In the papillary layer. It's another receptor. Your skin has lots of receptors. That's why you your skin is so sensitive. Turns out you got one more. It's called a Meissner's corpuscle, sometimes referred to as a tactile corpuscle, kind of like the tactile cell. It's called tactile because it's doing the same thing. It's helping you to feel light touch. So think tactile is light touch. And we also call it a Meissner's corpuscle. So those are things in the papillary layer and reticular layer of the dermis. Oh, we got to know one more thing. What is an epidermal ridge? Oh, epidermal ridges are just where the epidermis has been pushed up or elevated by a dermal papilla. Whenever you see a dermal papilla, it tends to push up the epidermis as well. So you can see this nice dermal papilla here has created this hump in the epidermis. Where there, if there is not dermal papilla, you don't see the skin push up. That hump in the epidermis is an epidermal ridge. There's a reason for it. Turns out your epidermal ridges help to increase your grip. This is fingerprints. When you look at your fingerprints, you're looking at your epidermal ridges. You're looking at where your epidermis has been pushed up by dermal papilla. But why do you have epidermal ridges again? It's for, finger, it's for gripping. Your body doesn't know you use fingerprints for identification. It's for gripping. This also explains what happens when you get wet for a long period of time. When you go to a pool or a bathtub, you always look pruny. Your hands and your feet get wrinkly. This is your body attempting to increase the wrinkles in your hands and your feet to increase your grip because your body knows you're slippery when wet. Oh, look at that. Okay, who knew? Science knew. Keep going. <clears throat> then we look at those three pigments in the skin. You know one, it's melanin, but there's two more. There's melanin, carotene, and hemoglobin. You got to know your three pigments, the color, and what is that pigment doing for your skin? First is melanin. Melanin, we already know, ranges from orangey red to brown black. But what does it do? Why do we have it? Turns out melanin protects you from UV rays because UV radiation could damage your DNA and lead to things like cancer. That's why if you get multiple suns in your life, you have an increased risk for skin cancer because you've exposed your skin and all the cells and their nuclei and your DNA to all that UV radiation. All right. So this is why you tan when you go outside. Remember, I love to tan. I think I look cute when I get a tan, but it's really my body saying, OMG, OMG, she tried to kill me with UV rays and I had to protect myself. Yeah, when you tan, that's your body saying, look at this stupid person trying to kill me with UV rays. Okay, now you know. Mel protects you from UV rays. It's like almost like natural sunblock. Keep going. It's not the only one. No, you don't need to know how we make melanin. I'm not going to ask that. Okay. There's no melanin. comes from melanocytes. Protects you from UV radiation. <clears throat> protects your keratinocytes from UV ra radiation. Keep going. There's another pigment. It's called carotene. Let's go down to carotene. Here we go. Carotene is a yellowy orange pigment. You see this a lot in your thick skin. That's why the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet are not white like the screen. It's kind of yellowishy, possibly orangey. It's because you're seeing where you have a lot of accumulation of keratin. It's in thick skin. Turns out your body uses keratin to make vitamin A to help with vision. So it turns out, yeah, when your mom told you to eat your Carrots, yes, it's possible that your carrots helped your vision. 
but most likely not. Your mom didn't tell you needed to eat a lot of it. But yeah, theoretically. But keep it simple, carotene, yellow orange, your body uses to help with vision. Okay. And then the last pigment is hemoglobin. This ranges from anywhere from pinkish to red. The more of it you have, the redder you look. And very simply, hemoglobin carries oxygen. Yes, we say red blood cells carry oxygen, but technically it's the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell that's carrying the oxygen. So when you're looking at your blood, especially oxygenated blood, you're really looking at all the hemoglobin inside. And so when you blush, you look red. You're seeing blood vessels dilate and you're seeing the red blood cells with their hemoglobin inside. That's the redness of your blood. It's hemoglobin. And what does it do? Carry oxygen. Keep it that simple. Keep it that simple. And now that you know the natural colors that you should have in your skin, now we could talk about some abnormal colors. Specific colors and indicate a disease, something wrong going on. You're just going to stick to these that are in your lecture PowerPoint. There's erythema, there's pallor, and there's cyanosis. I know I put jaundice, but don't worry about that. Okay. So what are these colors? You got to know the color name. What color is that actually? And what does that correlate to? What's the problem going on? So let's go through them. Erythema, pallor, and cyanosis. First is erythema. Erythema is when you turn bright red. Ah, oh, remember what's red again? Hemoglobin. And where's hemoglobin in blood? So tend to turn red when you have increased blood flow. Keep it that simple. Erythema is redness, and it's because of increased blood flow. Why you'll have increased blood flow? Maybe you have a fever. Maybe you have infection. But the bottom line is an increase in blood flow. That is erythema. Okay. And if you have an increased blood flow in this class, you can have decreased blood flow. And if you have decreased blood flow, you're going to look pale, ghostly white. That's called pallor. Okay. Pallor is this whitish color. Okay. Sometimes a grayish color. It's because you're seeing decreased blood flow. Again, there's lots of reasons for decreased blood flow. Maybe you're losing blood. Maybe you have a wound and you're losing blood. That will lead to decreased blood flow. Okay. Keep going. Then the last one is cyanosis. This is when you turn blue, bluish in color. Okay. I know they say bluish, reddish, purplish. No, it's bluish. Okay. And this is because of a lack of oxygen. Yeah, and this is why on TV, when people are getting suffocated or when they get too cold, they turn blue. So both of those situations have the same thing going on. When you're suffocating and when you're extremely cold, you have decreased oxygen levels. And you will turn blue. We call that cyanosis. Keep it that simple. Blue is cyanosis because of lack of oxygen. Whitish pale is pallor because of decreased blood flow. And redness is erythema because of increased blood flow. Look at that. You're halfway to being a doctor now. Okay. Keep going. Now, of course, you're going to have to know functions of skin. Okay. Well, one thing skin could do is provide protection. It could even help to regulate your body's temperature. How? You know how. Think about what happens when you're hot and when you're cold. When you're hot, you're going to sweat. Ah, but also, the blood vessels in your skin are going to vasodilate. When they dilate, that means their diameter gets bigger. So it's like they're opening up. That's why you tend to look red when you're hot. You're seeing vasodilation in the skin. Why? Because blood flows, you lose heat. So you dilate. You open up that blood vessel so more blood could flow and you could release the heat. Yeah. And then the opposite happens when you're cold. When you're cold, you're, you're going to stop sweating. You're going to have a cessation of sweating, meaning stop sweating. Why? Because sweating cools you down and you're cold and you don't want to get cooled down any further. So you're going to stop sweating. And then your blood vessels are going to do the opposite. They're going to vasoconstrict. Remember, when blood flows, you lose heat. But you're cold right now, so you don't want to lose heat. So when you're cold, you're going to stop eating and your blood vessels are going to vasoconstrict. 
And that's how your skin can help you to control your body temperature. It's one of its functions. And then to finish off this chapter, we look at the structures in skin, mainly hair, uh, nails, and glands. And then we finish off with some things that could go wrong. So first up is hair. Why do you have hair? Well, for one, hair can provide protection. It's kind of like skin in terms of structure and function. Your hair could protect you. Imagine if you have enough hair, you could act like a hat. If you have enough hair, it could shield you from the sun, kind of like a hat. If you have enough hair, it could protect you from the cold. Again, kind of like a hat. Hair could even act as an indicator if something is crawling on you. Some bugs are too small to activate the receptors in the skin. And the only way that you know that they're crawling on you is when they brush a hair. Because some hairs are also associated with receptors. And then hair could even indicate sexual maturity as a function. You know, by now, when you hit puberty, you grow hair, at least as you didn't have it before. So hair could act as an indicator for sexual maturity. So those are some of the functions of hair. And then there's the anatomy of a hair. <clears throat> hair acts and looks pretty much like skin. Just like skin, your hair is made up of keratinocytes and keratin. It's just that you have more keratin and a harder form of keratin in your hair than you do in your skin. And then you get, what I'm really going to look at is the cells again. Where in the hair are the cells alive? It's not in the shaft. The shaft, they, the cells are dead. How do you know? Because you could cut the shaft. You cut your hair and it doesn't hurt. It's because dead cells cannot tell you to feel pain. When, when can you feel pain? When someone rips your hair out. It's because below the skin, aka the root of the hair, is where you're going to have cells that are alive, especially in the papilla of the hair, which is this little oval-shaped area. That's the hair papilla. You have lots of blood vessels to nourish living cells in that area. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm not going to ask any other. Where are cells alive? Down in the root and in the center in that cortex and the papilla area. Right. That's it for hair. What is hair made up of? Keratin and keratinocytes making them just like the skin. Keep going. Then we even look at glands, mainly sweat and sebaceous glands. You got to know simply what's the difference. They tell you the name. Sweat glands make sweat. So they'll send their duct to the surface of the skin to release the sweat there. While sebaceous glands make, a, make an oil called sebum. And that sebum is for your hair. It's acti acting as a conditioner, even a cleanser, because it could kill bacteria. So you tend to see sebaceous glands associated with a hair. That's the difference. Where is it? What does it do? Sweat glands make sweat. So they're going to see their ducts located going towards the surface of the skin. While your sebaceous glands make an oil called sebum for the hair. So you're going to see a sebaceous glands and sweat glands. And then we finish off with when some things go wrong. We really look at skin cancer and burns. Those are two things that could go wrong. Let's go back to your lecture properly. Looking at skin cancer and burns. <clears throat> we already looked at glands. There we go. First up are burns. Okay. Like usual, there are multiple types of burns, so we categorize them. You got to know these three groups of burns. How much of the skin does that burn affect, and is it initially painful? Okay. Know the burn, how much of the skin it affects, and is it initially painful? So what are the burns? There's a first-degree burn a second degree burn, and a third degree burn. Let's do the first degree burn first. And you can see it all on the picture. First degree burn affects only the epidermis. Yeah. That's things like this guy here has on his, on his legs. That's a sunburn. Okay. Is a sunburn initially painful? Don't think about the day you spent playing at the beach. Think, when you know you have a sunburn, does it hurt? If I were to slap this guy in the leg, will he slap me in the face? Yes. Why? Because it hurts. It's initially painful. That's all you got to know. First degree burn affects only the epidermis, and it is initially painful. Keep going. 
Then there's a second degree burn. This is more of what people think of as a traditional burn. Think of touching a hot stove or getting caught in a fire. Odds are you're going to get a blister. Whenever you see a blister, for example, you're seeing, seeing a result of a second degree burn. But again, what do we got to know? Know the burn, know how much of the skin is affected, and is it initially painful? Well, you can see from the picture, second degree burn affects all of the epidermis and some of the dermis. And all of the epidermis and only some of the dermis. And is this initially painful? When you put your hand on a hot stove, does it hurt right away? Or can you cook your hand for about five minutes? No, it hurts right away. This is initially painful. And then the last burn is a third degree burn. Again, you can see from the picture, this is the worst of all because it affects everything. It affects all the skin, epidermis and the dermis. And it even affects things under the skin like fat called the hypodermis as well as muscle and bone. It gets everything. Okay, this is bad. So is this initially painful? Let me give you a hint. You burnt everything, including nerves and receptors. So it turns out this is initially painless because you damage your nerves and receptors. But your body's going to try to recoup and heal. Give them a couple hours. These will be the people burning or uh, screaming in the burn unit. But initially, it's painless. Give them as simple as I explained. And then you even talk about how do you heal or help someone to treat a burn. Okay. Well, you got to think when you're treating a burn, you got to give people what they're missing. You got to remember, this is skin that's been affected. And one thing skin does is keep everything inside protected from everything outside. What's inside? Well, you're mainly water. So that's something your body, your skin is keeping inside. So when you lose your skin, you begin to lose water. So if you've ever had a burn and then you touch it, it might feel a little sticky, a little wet. That's you losing some fluid. So when you're treating someone's burns, something you're going to have to do is treat them for dehydration because they are losing liquids because they don't have the skin to provide the barrier. But you got to know how much liquid to give them and how much liquid will depend on how much skin has been burned. So to help you calculate how much liquid to give them, we come up with something called the rule of nines. Kind of gives you a hint. It's called a rule of nines because we basically break up the body's skin into nine percentage point areas, meaning a certain area represents 9% of the surface of your body. For example, your entire right upper limb represents 9%. It's broken up into the front half 4.5 and the back half 4.5. So the entire upper limb, right upper limb, is 9% of your body's total surface area. As opposed to things like the lower limb, your in front of your right lower limb is 9%. And the back is another 9%. Why? You could tell your lower limb is a lot bigger than the upper limb. So there is more surface there. So I could calculate how much of your body's surface area has been affected. And I will treat accordingly. On your exam, I expect you to know these areas. I could say a patient has burnt their entire right upper limb and their entire left lower limb. How much of this person's surface area has been affected? Well, I said their entire right upper limb. So that's front and back. So that's nine. And I said their entire left lower limb. Remember, front is 9% and back is 9%. So that's 18. So 9 plus 18 is 27. 27% of this person's body surface has been burned. I expect you to do that math for exam. All right. <clears throat> so that's rule of nines. Okay, how does it relate to burns again? It calculates the surface area affected by a burn and helps you to estimate how much fluid a person will need. And then last thing you got to know are some changes that occur in the skin with puberty. Okay? Kind of think of our teenagers on TV. Well, they usually look greasy. Why? It doesn't matter how many times you take a bath as a teenager. You will probably look greasy at some point because you're having increased glandular activity. Why? It's just hormones. Hormones affect your glands, and you have a lot of hormonal changes during puberty. 
And then what else? You remember, during puberty, you grow hair in places you didn't have it before. And you grow a type of hair called terminal hair. That's thicker, pigmented hair. It's the hair you have on your head. Okay, so guys, when you grow your beard, you're growing a terminal hair similar to the hair on your head or a hair on your eyebrows. That's terminal hair. It's thicker, more pigment, pigmented hair. That's chapter five. And then the last chapter is chapter six. And with chapter six, again, we go on to another organ system. We go on now to the skeletal system. Again, a lot of this is repeat because we've seen bone, the organs, and bone, the tissues already in lab. You were even tested over it, so you know this stuff. You functions of skeletal system way back from chapter one. They do things like help you to move, protect you, and you know now they even do things like store fat, like the yellow bone marrow and the medullary cavity of your long bone. Well, no, don't worry, let's go through some of these bullet points. For one, you have to know your bone shapes again, okay? Remember, you got a lot of different bones in your body. You got over 200 bones, and they do not look the same. So one thing we got to do with all the different bones in your body is group them, classify them. Remember, this class loves to classify things. And when we look at all the shapes your bones could take, they fall into one of these tiers. You got to know the shape and an example of a bone that fits that shape. Again, you know this. You know a long bone is longer than it is wide, like the humerus of your arm or the femur of your thigh. Remember, even in your fingers, those phalanges are long bones. Even in the palm of your hands, those metacarpals are longer than they are wide. They are long bones. Same thing for the toes. Those are phalanges. Those are long bones. And your metatarsals in the flatter part of your foot. Those are long bones, too. Remember, also have short bones, bones that are about as wide as they are long, like the carpal bones in your wrist or the tarsal bones in your ankle. Remember, some bones are really thin. We call them flat bones, like your sternum sometimes called the breastbone, or your skull. Remember, even though your skull curves, when you cut it open and look, it's very thin. Your skull is a flat bone. Same thing for the ribs. Your ribs are flat bone. And then you have a sesamoid bone. Remember, this is a special type of bone. A sesamoid bone is a bone trapped in a tendon. Remember, an example is your kneecap. Your kneecap is a bone called the patella. This is why you can wiggle your patella to a certain extent. It's because it's trapped in a tendon. And then there are some of the other categories. Remember, those are irregular bones, like your vertebral bones in your spine or your lower jaw called the mandible. They don't fit any of these other categories, so they're irregularly shaped bones. We knew those already. Even knew the anatomy of a long bone. Oh, yeah, you got to know that, know that again. Remember, the middle is called the diaphysis. The ends are called the epiphysis. Remember, when you crack it open, the diaphysis is hollowed out. It has a medullary cavity, but it's not empty. You can see in the picture, you have a yellow bone marrow there. All right. So just review your long bone anatomy. <clears throat> I mentioned yellow bone marrow. You actually have two types of bone marrow, yellow and red. And you're going to have to know the difference between both of them. Yellow bone marrow is fat. So that's how your body stores fat to a certain extent. Some of it is stored as yellow bone marrow. While red bone marrow is red, think about what's red in your body. Red bone marrow is where you make red blood cells or practically all your blood cells process of making blood cells is called hematopoiesis. So we say you do hematopoiesis in red bone marrow. Keep going. We even look at the ingredients bone. Oh, what sort of parts to bone? Well, you have an inorganic and an organic component. And we're thinking ingredients. So yeah, we got to think back to our chemical level. Got to think back to inorganic and organic chemistry. Uh-oh. But we're just talking about ingredients. What's the inorganic stuff? Well, that's the minerals making up your bone. That's things like calcium and phosphorus forming these hydroxyapatite crystals. That's the inorganic stuff, calcium and phosphorus. And they're what makes your bone hard. Now you got to know how they affect it. Makes the bone hard, calcium. And then there's the organic stuff. This is proteins. This is collagen. 
collagen is the organic component to your bone. And collagen, you already know, pre prevents excess stretching while also allowing for some flexibility. So you could imagine if I were to take away all the inorganic stuff, all the calcium, my bones will get very flexible. Or if I were to take away the organic stuff, my bones will get very hard and brittle. Those are your organic and inorganic components and what happens when you remove them. Keep going. Huh. We even revisit the tissue. And you remember, tissues are made up of cells. You got cells in your, or in your bone tissue. You know some already. Think back to when we did the bone tissue. Remember we saw osteocytes sitting in lacuna? And the reason why they're sitting in lacuna is because they're helping to monitor and maintain the bone. But osteocytes aren't the only cells. You also have cells to build the bone. The cells that build bone are called osteocytes. And again, if you could build something, you could break it down. The cells that break down bone are called osteoclasts. So know those three cells and what are they doing? Are you building, making bone? Depositing bone is another way to say it, osteoblasts. Are you breaking down bone? Another way to say it is to resorb bone or to do resorption. That means to break down. That is the osteoclast. And then there's the cell that monitors and maintains the bone. That's the osteocyte. Okay. So those are your three bone types, bone cells and what they do. Keep going. Got a couple more things to do. <clears throat> We already did the osteon when we looked at bone under the microscope in the lab. You know it has a central canal holding blood vessels. It has circumferential lamellae wrapping around in little rings. You have the osteocytes in their lacuna with canal liculi for a line for communication. We've done that before. <clears throat> you even have to know that the osteon is the basic structural unit. You just got to know this phrase. The osteon is the basic structural unit of bone. This is basically saying that the osteon is the building block of bone. Keep going. Remember, you even have different types of bone. Remember, you have compact bone that tends to be more superficial, providing protection. And you have spongy bone, usually located more internally, sometimes trapped between layers uh, of compact bone. For example, when you look at uh, a flat bone up close, here's a flat bone, like the bone of your skull. In the middle will be a spongy bone. And again, on the surface or close to the surface, you have the compact bone providing protection. Or if you're looking at a long bone, it'll be again deeper inside in the epiphyses is where you're going to find your spongy bone. And again, on more superficial, you'll find the compact bone for protection. <clears throat> And you remember when we looked at spongy bone under the microscope, it had uh, uh, pictures of it, not under the microscope, pictures of it. We saw this weird forest of bone. Remember, we called that trabeculae. Remember, that trabeculae was helping to trap and support some bone marrow, like red bone marrow trapped in your epiphyses. And then we look at how you make bone and how you grow bone and things that could affect it. And like usual, we finish off with when things go wrong. Okay. So first up is how do you make bone? The process of making bone is called ossification. And like usual, your body has options. You have two types of ossification. There's intramembrous ossification and there's endochondrial ossification. You got to know the difference between intramembranous and endochondrial ossification. They're both ossification. So they're both going to be how your body makes bone. So what are some differences you're going to have to know? Well, you're going to have bone shapes like to be made via each way. You're going to have to know what's the starting material. I know to you, bones don't seem that big of a structure. But to your body, bones are huge. So when you think about making bones, it helps to think about how people make large structures, like the Statue of Liberty. When they made the Statue of Liberty, they didn't just start making it. They made a small scale model. That tends to happen. Before you make a huge structure, you make a small scale model. And it's like your body does the same thing. So one difference is what material is that model made of? Yeah, so we can see some of that here. And like usual, their names give you a hint. Don't be intimidated. 
First up is intramembranous ossification. Turns out your fat bones are made this way. So think skull, ribs, sternum. They will be made via intramembranous ossification. This is for flat bones. And its name gives you a hint as to the starting material. Starting material is an embryonic connective tissue we call mesenchyme or mesenchymal membrane. Here's, here it is, mesenchymal. Okay, mesenchymal membrane or mesenchyme. This is an embryonic connective tissue. That's all that it is. It's just a connective tissue before you were born, as you're developing. Okay? That is the starting material in intramembranous ossification. And endochondrial ossification, again, it gives you a hint in the name. Oh, look at the name. I see chondro, like hypochondriac. We've seen chondro before, or chondrocyte. Remember, I told you that means cartilage. So in endochondrial ossification, the starting material is cartilage, specifically hyaline cartilage. Okay. And what bone shapes like to be made via endochondrial ossification? It's your long bones. And then the last thing you got to know is something called an ossification center. They tell you the name. Remember, ossification is the process of making bones. So an ossification center is where you're making bones. And there's something called a primary ossification center and a secondary. In intramembranous ossification, the primary ossification center is in the spongy bone. So the first place you're going to make bone is in the middle. You're going to start off with the spongy bone first with your primary ossification center. And then you move outward and do the compact bone later. And you have something similar going on in endochondrial ossification as well. There's the first place you make bone, primary ossification center. And then you also have a secondary. You know where those are. Then go to a picture. Um, I can see it on this picture here. I see a primary ossification center and a secondary. Turns out in endochondrial ossification of a long bone, the primary ossification center is in the diaphysis. So you make the diaphysis first, and then you move out to the epiphysis in the secondary ossification center. So those are differences. What does do you need to know? What bone shapes are made which way? Flat bones, intramembranous, long bones, endochondrial. What's the starting material? Mesenchyme or your mesenchymal membrane for intramembranous and cartilage for endochondrial. Where's the primary ossification center? In intramembranous, it's the spongy bone. In endochondrial, it's the diaphysis. And in endochondrial, the secondary ossification center is in the epiphysis. And now that you know how to make bone to a certain extent, now we got to grow it. And when we grow a bone, we grow in length. We call that longitudinal bone growth. And we grow in width. We call that appositional bone growth. Oh, we got to know about bone. Let's do um, length first. Let's do longi longitudinal bone growth first. <clears throat> and this is going to involve your, epiphys your epiphyseal plate. Okay. Remember, your epiphyseal plate is just a strip of cartilage separating the epiphysis from the diaphysis.
sorry about that. I had a little situation here, but well, we're back to finish off this review. I'm going to just give my computer a second here. So we're talking about growing bone in length. And it, I told you it involves that pivotal plate. Well, turns out this is going to help you to grow because it's made up of cartilage cells. You could almost imagine you're doing endochondral ossification still. So we're replacing cartilage with bone. That's why you're using the epiphyseal plate. And when we look at the epiphyseal plate, I mentioned we break it down into different zones. You got to know your zones in order and what happens in each zone. It's in order. So we're starting on in the epiphyseal plate closer to the epiphysis side. So if we were to go back to this picture, we start off on the side closer to the epiphysis and we're going towards the diaphysis. That's the order. So closer to the epiphysis side is the zone of reserve cartilage, sometimes called the zone of resting cartilage in case you use a different textbook. Then there's the zone of proliferation, followed by the zone of hypertrophy and maturation. Then there's the zone of calcification. And then closer to the diaphysis is the zone of ossification. Okay. So let's go through them and talk about what happens in each zone. And here we see them. Starting on the cl side closer to the epiphysis is the zone of rest uh, reserve cartilage. Here is where your cells aren't doing anything. They're the reserve. This is where you're going to begin to recruit cartilage cells from. So they're, they're kind of resting here, waiting to be recruited. And once they're recruited, you'll move into the zone of proliferation. Again, it tells you the name. Here, your chondrocytes are going to proliferate. They're going to do mitosis and cytokinesis and split into daughter cells. So this is where you're going to have lots of chondrocytes. That's why when you look at them, the zone of reserve cartilage is smaller. Then all of a sudden it gets bigger in the zone of proliferation because your chondrocytes are proliferating. They're doing uh, my, mitosis and cytokinesis. They're splitting into daughter cells. They're making more cells here. And then once they make more cells, they'll move on to the zone of hypertrophy and maturation. Again, it tells you the name. To hypertrophy means to get bigger and to mature means to get older. So in the zone of hypertrophy and maturation, your chondrocytes are getting bigger, hypertrophy, and older, maturing, maturation. All right. And then once you're a mature chondrocyte, it's like you're an old adult. Well, the next step, you're not going to like it, it's death. Okay die and they're going to die and and calcify in the zone of calcification okay, meaning they're going to calcify get turned um turned into partially and having calcium deposited on them and these calcified chondrocytes kind of act as a signal to tell osteoblasts or to begin building bone so once you have the signal well you're going to go on to the last zone the zone of ossification remember ossification is the process of making bone and you remember osteoblasts build bone so in this zone, you now have osteoblasts coming to make bone. And it's almost like you're adding more layers to the diaphysis. That's why you grow in order towards the diaphysis. This is how you're going to get taller. Recruit cells from the re reserve cartilage. Have them um, procreate, split into daughter cells proliferation. Have them grow bigger. You can literally see that. They get bigger and older hypertrophy and maturation, then they die and calcify, ossification, then you begin to build bone with your osteoblast, ossification. Those are your zones. That's how you get taller. And then we even have to talk about how you get wider in your bones. We got to talk about acquisitional bone growth. This one is pretty straightforward to grow wider to have appositional bone growth, you pretty much have osteoblasts sneak under the periosteum. Remember, periosteum is the connective tissue around your bone. So osteoblasts pretty much go underneath the periosteum and add more layers of bone. They add layers that are not part of an osteon. Remember, we saw some little lamellae between osteons. Remember, those were interstitial lamellae. But these tend to add more uh, serpential lamellae to the outside. 
So that's all that happens. To add more lamellae, your osteoblasts go underneath the periosteum and add more layers of bone. That's appositional bone growth. That's it. It is just really these slides here. You go underneath the periosteum and just add more bone to the surface. Okay. And it's actually circumferential lamellae that they're adding. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> And then, now that you know how to make and grow bone, we finish off with some things that could affect bone growth, yeah. mainly hormones. Got to know these three hormones, estrogen, calcitonin, and parathyroid hormone, how they put, uh, affect the bone and why. Okay. First up, we'll do thyroid uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll do parathyroid hormone first. <clears throat> Turns out parathyroid hor hormone will help to increase your calcium levels when your calcium gets too low. Okay, so why does it do it? You release hormone. Why? Because your calcium level was too low. Why? Because parathyroid hormone will raise your calcium level. That sounds a lot like negative feedback, where the initial res uh, stimulus was low calcium, the end result is going to be high. Okay. And how does parathyroid hormone do this? It's going to go to three places. Well, this is a bone chapter, so one place it's going to go is to bone. And in bone, parathyroid hormone will stimulate osteoclast. Right? Osteoclasts will break down bone and release calcium, which will help to raise your calcium level. It will also go to your intestines. Why? You absorb calcium from the Fuji. So when your calcium level is low, you'll release parathyroid hormone to cause you to absorb more calcium. It will increase calcium absorption, which will increase your calcium levels. And then the last place it will go is to the kidney. Why? Because you could pee out calcium. You could excrete it, meaning pee it out. And right now your calcium level is low, so you don't want to pee it out. So parathyroid hormone will go to the kidney to inhibit calcium excretion, to keep you from peeing it out, all so you can raise your levels again. That's it for parathyroid hormone. Your calcium levels are low. You release parathyroid hormone to stimulate osteoclasts and break down bone and release calcium. Increase calcium absorption in the kidney and in the intestine, sorry, and inhibit calcium excretion in the kidney. Also, you could raise your calcium levels. Then there's calcitonin. Calcitonin is basically the opposite of parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone raises calcium levels, well, calcitonin will drop them. So you release calcitonin when your calcium levels are too high, and you need to bring it back down again. So how is calcitonin going to drop your calcium levels? Well, calcitonin goes to some of the same places. It also goes to bone. And in bone, calcitonin will now stimulate osteoblasts and inhibit osteoclasts. How? Calcitonin stimulates osteoblasts to build bone. And when they build bone, they're going to use some of that extra calcium you have too much of. And that will help to bring your calcium levels down. It will even go to the kidneys. Remember, you can pee out calcium. You can excrete it. So when your calcium levels are too high, calcitonin goes to the kidneys to increase calcium excretion. So you can bring calcium levels back down. It doesn't really go to the intestine. And then there's the hormone estrogen. Estrogen is kind of like testosterone. Just like testosterone, estrogen stimulates bone growth. Estrogen stimulates bone growth. That's why just like males, because in puberty in high levels, they will have growth spurts. Same thing for females. That's why females also have growth spurts, because estrogen stimulates bone growth. But at the same time, estrogen stimulates the closure of your epiphyseal plate, meaning it will turn it into pure bone, meaning you will stop growing. This is why females tend to be shorter on average. Even though they have growth spurts stimulated by estrogen, they will stop growing faster because estrogen also stimulates closure of the growth plate. <clears throat> and it does one more thing. Estrogen even inhibits osteoclasts. That's why you see 
problem occurring females when she gets older. Females, older females, are at higher risks of things like osteoporosis. Why? Well, for one, when you get older as a female, you hit menopause. And in menopause, you stop having your period. Why? Because your estrogen levels have dropped. That's what happens when you get older. And so it will affect things like your reproductive system, meaning you'll have a cessation of periods. You'll stop having a period, a monthly menstrual cycle. But estrogen affects other things. Remember, estrogen inhibits osteoclasts. So when your estrogen levels drop during menopause, you are now losing the thing that inhibits osteoclasts. There is nothing to inhibit them anymore. So they go to work eating away at your bone, and your bone begin, becomes less dense and fragile. You get osteoporosis. Okay? So estrogen does a couple things. Promotes bone growth, promotes the closure of the epiphyseal plate, and inhibits osteoclasts. And then you got to know some vitamins. Got to know some vitamins and minerals needed for good bone health. You already know you need calcium. Why? Because it's a direct ingredient in your bone. You need vitamin C because it helps you to form collagen. Kind of think the C in vitamin C is for the C in collagen. You need it for a good collagen. And you won't even absorb your calcium in your intestines unless you have vitamin D. Luckily, as long as your skin gets exposed to the sunlight, gets exposed to some UV radiation, you will make vitamin D. That's why when you go to the store and you look at cartons, whenever they say calcium, they also says and vitamin D. Because vitamin D allows you to absorb or helps you to absorb the calcium. And then we finish off with when things go wrong. And one thing that could go wrong with your bones is you could break them. We call them a fracture. Like a lot of other things in this class, there are lots of options. There are lots of ways to break a bone. There are lots of different types of fractures. So like usual, when we talk about a fracture, we got to group them. We look at all the different types of broken bones. They fall into one of two groups. There are simple fractures and compound fracture. With whether or not the bone sticks out of the skin. Did you break the skin? If you broke a bone and it does not pierce the skin, we call that a simple fracture. The skin remains intact, meaning you didn't break the skin. Think of these as, as cracks in bone or, or hairline fractures. They don't tend to break the skin. But sometimes when you have a bone, it will stick out of the skin. It will pierce the skin. It will break the skin. It will damage the skin. We call these compound fractures. Turns out compound fractures are more common in movies because they're more dramatic. It's more dramatic to see the bone sticking out. So movies love to show compound fractures. Right. But then there are specific fractures now. You got to know these six specific fractures. And I could describe them. I'm not going to put up a picture, but I could describe the fracture and ask you what type of fracture it is. Let's go through these six and I'll describe them for you. First up is a spiral fracture. That's what you see here. And a spiral fracture, when you break the bone, it twists and rotates. That's a spiral fracture. Why? You got to remember, muscle is attached to your bone. And it's under a, a bit of tension. So when you break the bone, the muscle is still going to pull on it and possibly cause it to twist. So a twisting or rotating of a broken bone is a spiral fracture. Then you have a comminuted fracture. In a comminuted fracture, you shatter bone into pieces. Key phrase here is shatter bone. Okay, Kind of like glass. You could shatter bone just like glass. That's a comminuted fracture. Sometimes when you break a bone, it's not going to snap in two completely. It's going to bend and crack. We call those green stick fractures. Kind of gives you a hint in the name. You literally have to think of a green stick on a tree. There's different types of sticks. You can have an old, dry, brown of a tree. If you were to pull that off and bend it, it will snap in two. That old, dry, brown branch. But if you were to get a younger, healthier green branch and try to bend it, well, it's not going to snap in two. It's going to bend and crack. That's the same thing that can happen to some bones. They bend and crack instead of snapping in two. We call those a green stick fracture. It tends to happen a lot in kids because remember kids, especially in their long bones, have cartilage that needs to be replaced. 
they're doing endochondral ossification. So all that extra cartilage tends to allow for some flexibility. So kids, you'll see green stick fractures where their bones bend and crack because there's still some cartilage there instead of fracturing into. And then there's a compression fracture. And a compression fracture, you crush bone. That's what you see in this vertebra right here. They crush the bone. Okay, that's a compression fracture. Key phrase here is you crush bone. Then there's an avulsion. In an avulsion, you're going to attach to a ligament or a, te a tendon, and you might even rip some of the ligament and tendon. That's it. You have a lot of that in your ankle because you have lots of tendons and ligaments in the ankle. So you could kind of break and chip a bone, and that bone will still be attached to a ligament or tendon. That's an avulsion. And then some unfortunate kids get a break right in their epiphyseal plate. So we call those epiphyseal plate fractures. You break the bone right at where that cartilage is. That's an epiphyseal plate fracture. So know your fractures. Then I can describe it and I see the same. And then to finish, we talk about how do you fix a broken bone. We talk about bone healing. You got four steps of bone healing in order and what happens in each step. You see them all on this picture. In order, it's a hematoma formation followed by a fibrocartilaginous callus, sometimes called a soft callus formation. Then you have a bony callus, sometimes called a hard callus formation. And then you finish off with bone remodeling. So in order, it's hematoma formation. Fibrocartilaginous callus, aka soft callus formation, bony callus, aka hard callus formation, and then and then bone remodeling. So what happens in each phase? Again, they're named a hint. First step is hematoma. Let's say you're rollerblading outside, you trip and oh, you broke your leg. Okay. Well, you're gonna have bleeding. Remember, bone is a connective tissue. That is not cartilage, so it's highly vascular. There are blood vessels. So when you break the bone, you're going to have bleeding, and that blood is going to fill up all the nooks and crannies, and it's going to clot. We call blood clots in anatomy hematomas. So the first step when you break a bone is you're going to bleed, and it's going to fill up all the gaps and clot. You're going to get a hematoma. And you're going to stay in this phase for about two weeks. So when you break your leg, you go to the hospital, they put you in a cast, and you go home, you'll still be in this phase for the next two weeks. Then after that, you'll move on to the next phase, where you form your soft callus, or your fibrocartilaginous callus. If you call it a fibrocartilaginous callus, it gives you a hint. You're now going to replace all the blood, all the hematoma, the blood clot, with fibrocartilage. You're going to see fibroblasts and collagen because it's fibrocartilage and chondrocytes. All right. And you'll be in that phase for about another three weeks. Then after that, you'll finally replace all the fibrocartilage with bone and form a bone callus or a bony callus. Okay. This is just you having osteoblasts come in and replace the cartilage with bone. And then after that, you'll finish up with bone remodeling. Why? When you make your bony callus, it's called a callus because it kind of bows out a little bit, kind of like a callus. But when you make this bony callus, it's not quite nice and neat looking bone. You can see from the picture, it's not quite all nice and neat compact bone on the outside, the spongy bone on the inside. They got to clean it up. They got to replace some bone with new bone. You got to break bone down bone resorption, and you got to make bone, bone deposition. You got to do some osteoclast work and some osteoblast work. When you break some bone down to build bone up, we call that bone remodeling. You can see from the last picture, now it looks better like the surrounding bone. You just had to clean it up a bit. And this is all your body will do. Hematoma formation, fibrocartilaginous callus formation, bony callus formation, and then bone remodeling. You will fix your bone. And that's chapter six. And that's your unit two exam review. Sorry for the in between.